Hi, and welcome to Build Resilient, Easy to Manage, Continuous Integration Workflows with AWS Code Build and AWS Step Functions. My name is Richard Boyd, and I'm a developer advocate for AWS Developer Tools, and I'll be presenting today. Today, we're going to cover an introduction to AWS Code Build, followed by an introduction to AWS Step Functions, and we'll walk through a demo application that shows how these two services work well together, and then we'll have a short Q&A session where you can ask any questions you might have. AWS Code Build is a fully managed continuous integration service that compiles source code, runs tests, and produces software packages that are ready to deploy. With Code Build, you don't need to provision, manage, or scale your own build servers. Code Build scales continuously and processes multiple builds concurrently, so your builds are not left waiting in a queue. You can get started quickly by using prepackaged build environments, or you can create custom build environments that use your own build tools. With the pre-built environments, you can get instances with the smallest three or as large as 244 gigabytes of memory. You can get instances with as few as two or as much as 72 virtual CPUs that supports on ARM architecture. And we even have environments available for, for Windows if you, for when you want to build your Windows applications. For all of these, you pay per use uh, and you're billed by the minute. So if your build is seven minutes long, you pay for seven minutes of use, you're not paying for a build server for an entire month or a year or a quarter or however long a, a lease is for the server. Right? So you, you pay for it as you need it. If you don't need any more, it scales back down, you pay nothing. Next, we have Step Functions. AWS Step Functions is a serverless function orchestrator that make it easy to sequence AWS Lambda functions and multiple AWS services into business critical applications. So it's visual interface, you can create and run a series of checkpointed and event-driven workflows that maintain the application state. The output of one step acts as the input into the next. Each step in your application executes an order and as expected based on your defined business logic, orchestrating a series of individual serverless applications. So today we're going to talk about how both these services are better together. AWS Step Functions is now integrated with AWS Code Build make it faster to build continuous integration workflows for your applications. You can easily create workflows, with primitives such as branching, parallel execution, and timeouts, and it has built-in error handling, parameter passing, and state management. We're going to drop a, a link into the chat uh, so you can see you know, some more detailed information about how these two services work together. But don't go chasing that link just yet because we're about to start a demo. In this demo, we're going to build a sample app or, or describe a sample application that we've built that um, you know, automatically manages pull requests for a code commit repository. We're using code commit because you know, that's my personal favorite. We can easily integrate this into any other you know, Git-based uh, software management service. Okay, so I've checked out my, the repository for my, my team's application. Um, I'm on the, the main branch, which is we, let's just assume that we do uh, trunk-based development. Um, I'm going to make a small change, or we're going to see how it kind of flows through this workflow. Right. So from the main repository, I'm going to say git checkout minus branch, and then we'll call it new feature. All right. So switch to a new branch. Um, I'm, let's say it's a very complicated feature that's just a single file. Um, I'll actually I'll just update. I think I have. If you, so let's just say I'm, I'm adding some documentation to an existing file. That'll be the extent of this feature. And I will say um, contributors and then Richard was here. So I made a very sophisticated change to this application. I can do git status to see uh, how my branch looks compared to uh, the branch that's worked from. Uh, okay, so we see we've modified this file. Let's go ahead and add that for staging. Add the file, and then we will now commit that with a message, added new contributor feature. And then we're gonna push this back to the origin. So we're gonna say git push. And to, because I created a new branch, I have to say what branch I'm gonna push it to. Uh, and we will call this new feature. And this has been pushed. So I checked out the repository, I made my change, and I pushed it back to the, the branch. 
So I can go to code commit, look at my code. I can create a pull request. Um, and new feature is this branch that I just created. And we're going to merge that into the, the, the main branch. The branch that we call main is our trunk base. So we'll compare these two. Title, let's say Richard feature was added. And description goes here. And then we see a, a diff for it. These are the changes that I made. Uh, like I said, I have very many files. And we will create this pull request. Now, what this repository has set up is a set of approval rules um, with these approval rule templates. So I call it this basic approval rule. It means one person has to approve it. Um, and that person can't be the same person who made the, the pull request. So although I personally can't do this, I will show you in just a moment. I'm just going to simulate someone else approving this. And we see that there is no, no comments, no activity in here. What has happened kind of under the hood is that when I created this new branch, it started, let me refresh this, it started this step function workflow that is validating the commit that I did. So when I submitted a pull request, it's gonna go and fetch the, the code and then send it to code build to, to do the build and kind of make sure that it builds. A uh, common problem you have when you're working on a large team is that somebody will check in a change, it's broken, uh, it breaks the build, and then everyone kind of has to back out their changes to get the offending commit removed, and then everyone rolls their changes back forward again. With something like this, you could prevent breaking changes from uh, making their way into the, the main truck. This is going to catch kind of all of your breaking changes, but it'll catch a, a large number of them. And we see that this succeeded. What it did is it first ran the, what I call the run build step. Uh, let me see if I can show that. Run build. So it runs this. So I'm just going to make it a bit easier for everyone to read. Maybe. Oh, yeah. So I did the synchronous start build, which means it starts a build. It waits for the, the build to finish before it moves on to the next step. There's also a capability of just starting the build and going on with your day. If you're doing some kind of a load test or some other applications where it might be appropriate. For here, we want the results of the build, so we need to wait to make sure that it's actually done. Uh, and we tell it what repository to use, what build project. Uh, we'll talk more about the build project in, uh, later in the demo. Uh, but we're just saying, hey, go ahead and do this build. Uh, and then the response comes back. And let's see if I update pull request. This calls a Lambda function that I wrote that uh, takes the results of the build project and sends them to a Lambda function, which will post a, a comment on the pull request so that your teammates can see you know, kind of how good you did in terms of this specific one is focused on test coverage. So if we refresh this page, So we'll see two comments. The first one is for the test suite. So it says that there is two total tests um, and two of them succeeded. So 100% of our tests passed, which is great. The next one uses the code coverage feature, um, which shows the line coverage uh, as a percentage, the number of lines covered, the number that it missed. Um, and I, I didn't enable branch coverage when I did this test, but you could enable that branch nest covered, et cetera. So let's say I'm, I'm on a team, I'm another person who's on this team. I see this, I say, you know, 89 is good. That's a good percent. I mean, that's, that's a solid B plus. Let's go ahead and uh, approve this, this pull request. We see up here that there's zero of the one role satisfied. Uh, typically, uh, another user would be able to log into the console and they could click approve, but because I can't kind of log in to someone else, um, I'm going to use my console to, to simulate this. So the first thing I need to do is get the the revision ID. And this is something you would normally have to do like when you're doing this workflow. It's just doing it so I can simulate another person. Um, and I'm going to copy the revision ID and I'm going to remember that it's pull request 13. And I'm going to switch over to the console on my local machine. OK, so now I'm going to tell it what revision to use that I copied from that last step. And I will tell it what pull request, which was number 13. And 
uh, this is me just programmatically approving this. Normally someone else on my team would go into the console and click the button. Um, they wouldn't have to do this copy paste thing that I'm doing here. This is just to make the demo work a little smoother. Um, we press enter, we'll let that send. This API actually doesn't return a response unless there's an error. So this is the epitome of no news is good news. Um, so this means the pull request has been approved. So let's hop back over into our AWS console. Okay, so we're back in our console. Uh, we see that it says zero of one rule satisfied. That's just because I haven't updated the page yet. So I'm just gonna go ahead and refresh this page. And we see that's been approved. Um, now I could merge this. Normally you'd not wanna give someone permission to, to merge their own changes uh, because you wanna make sure that there's some kind of checks that have been done or some guarantees. So like we did with the uh, running the automated integration tests. Um, we have another step function that I will show you here that you know, validates that all of the approval rules have been met I think, and then merges the commit. So it took me long enough to jump back over that it like finished before I had a chance to get here to see it still running. Um, so in this step, it, it gets the pull request state change showing that the approval was, was done. So what this will do um, is it will say, okay, was the approval change like an approve mechanism? There's an approve option. Um, the other one being re uh, revoke, which is where someone had previously approved it and then they later revoked their approval. Um, for those, we would just not trigger on this because we specifically expect the approve statement. Um, and it sends it to a, um, it tells it to uh, run code build again. This will make sure that the uh, the build is passing all of its tests. Typically what happens is someone does like a pull request, uh, that'll go through and the builds will succeed. Someone will point out maybe a formatting issue or a small change that they would like to see in the code. Uh, and you know a few more commits are added to that. But because we only did that original build just that one time when the pull request was created, we wanna catch it again in case there was you know, more commits that were added to it later. Uh, so we, uh, we run the build again, if the build succeeds, we send the build and the commit information to another Lambda function that I wrote. It's a very small one I will show here. Uh, and all this does is it evaluates the pull request rule, uh, approval rule to say, uh, are, is it approved? That's true. And are there any approval rules not satisfied? You know, basically is, is it more than zero of them? If there's no unapproved, no not satisfied rules and it's marked as approved, we're gonna go ahead and merge this with a fast forward merge. Now, this could throw an error if you've got um, a weird branching mechanism where you're not quite caught up. You would just have to, uh, to rebase uh, against mainline so that you can effectively pull with a uh, fast forward commit, uh, which is the most common type of like painless commit there is. Um, and again, it would just get approved again and then go back through the, this process and then it would succeed. So we go into code commit, we see that this is approved. And it's gonna show us that it closed. So once it's approved and merged, yep. so we see that it has been merged, it was merged two minutes ago by my, my Lambda function. And now that my commit has been merged into the main branch, I can go to code pipeline, which again, it's moving a little bit faster than I am. We see the, the new contributor feature has already started the, the pipeline workflow. So it, it's pulled from the source. Uh, I went through like another, this would be a heavier integration test or a heavier build mechanism. Um, test that you wouldn't want to do for every commit. Uh, maybe it hits some API where you might be rate limited. It might uh, use a lot of resources, require like a GPU type instance or something very expensive that you don't want to do too often. Generally you want to avoid tests like that, uh, but you know, at some point these types of tests are needed. And then you can extend your pipeline to you know, deploy into a development stage or deploy into a test stage or a prod stage um, and go from there. So we'll hop back over into the, into the slides. Okay, so we're back from the demo. What we did in this, this demo application was that we checked out our code, created a new branch, implemented a feature on this new branch, and then pushed it back to our repository. And then in the repository, we created a pull request saying, I'd like to merge this change into the, the main branch so that it can be deployed 
into production eventually. When we created that pull request that told step functions to start executing, and it uh, you know, picked up those changes, did a code build, checking for code coverage and the test suite to make sure all of the unit tests pass, collected that data from code build, and then put that as a comment into the pull request so that people who are reviewing the pull request can see that, you know, yes, this will pass the test. It will have this kind of line coverage. So you don't have to worry about uh, merging in a change and then later seeing that it was broken. It broke the build. Some unit test that was supposed to run didn't run because the developer you know, either wasn't paying attention or misunderstood the way something was configured. Once the, the pull request was updated with these features, we'd simulated another user going in and you know, kind of manually approving programmatically that specific code request, pull request, and then that satisfied all of the rules for the approval rule, which meeting that satisfaction level told step functions to start another execution. It ran the build again just to verify that everything was still working in correct order, and then merged that change into the main branch. Once that, once that change was merged into the main branch, it was then released to code pipeline, which picked it up, ran the, your regular like deploy preparation build, um, and left it in that pipeline, which we could then later extend to you know, a test or production environment. I hope this has shown you the way that code pipeline, code build, step functions, uh, code commit all kind of work together and they're better together than they are as like some of individual services. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We have people in the chat who will answer them. Um, and if you have additional questions that we can't answer in the chat, feel free to email me at rhboyd at amazon.com or you can contact me on Twitter at Richard Boyd. Thank you.